Beijing's caught between a rock and a hard place, it would seem. Uh, what's the deal there, in your view? I think that Beijing borrows talking points from its reaction to Crimea annexation in 2014 and underscores the part of the message depending on the audience. When Chinese diplomats and senior leaders are talking to Western counterparts, they say that they support peace talks, they support Ukrainian sovereignty and territorial integrity. And at the same time, when they're talking to the Russians, they say that they don't support unilateral sanctions and they're critical of expansions of U.S.-led military alliances, be NATO and AUKUS in the Asia-Pacific. Well, absolutely. And, and if we look at what's going on in Ukraine, you've got to ask yourself, what is Vladimir Putin's endgame? I think that, unfortunately, plan A for a swift defeat with uh, not too many casualties, uh, decapitation or fleeing of Ukrainian political leadership doesn't work. So Russia is gradually moving to plan B, which is siege of major Ukrainian cities all-out assault on Ukrainian capital, and uh, think about Aleppo or Grozny. Unfortunately, the ugliest and bloodiest pages of this war are very likely in front of us, not behind us. Alexander, what's the way out for Putin? Obviously, he expected sanctions, but he didn't expect that unity and that extent of sanctions to come so soon. What's the way out for Putin right now? Uh, it's probably that the West also didn't anticipate the level of uh, unity and then the uh, extraordinary outpouring of corporate support for Ukraine and withdrawal from Russia. Uh, unfortunately, it doesn't look like Mr. Putin is deterred by the sanctions and he will seek leverage on the battlefield. So the original goal to establish control over southern and eastern Ukraine looks like it's still in the cards. Russia's position on the negotiations with Ukraine and aimed by uh, German Chancellor and French President is not softening for an inch. Vladimir Putin still has very clear red lines that cannot be met by President Vladimir Zelensky, and that means Russia will seek leverage on the battleground, not at the negotiating table. Would Putin have thought twice about attacking Ukraine if Donald Trump had been in power? It's unclear. We've seen uh, Russia's uh, adventurism and very high risk appetite for military operations before Donald Trump was sworn in as, as president and during Trump's presidency in Syria. So I, I don't think that Donald Trump would deter uh, President Putin. Probably he could have emboldened him even more. Now, the thing is here, what is his future at the end of all this? He's likely to be a pariah in the short term, but longer term, where does it leave, also leave Russia? Uh, imagine a nuclear-armed Iran that stretches from Europe through the Arctic, South Caucasus and the Middle East, all the way to Japan, China and the Indo-Pacific. That's the future of Russia. That's definitely not the future that Vladimir Putin has anticipated, but he has banked so much on this invasion of Ukraine that there is no way that he can admit it was a terrible mistake and go back home without achieving his political goals. So despite the rising cost for the Russian economy and the tragic death toll for Ukraine, uh, it's unlikely that he will turn back. So it's a nuclear-armed giant Iran. That's the future. However you look at it, the U.S. and its allies are waking up to the idea of a closer bond between China and Russia. What might this mean for the rest of the world, you think? I think that China here is very pragmatic and addressing its own interests first and foremost. The alignment with Russia was there in the making since late 80s and definitely has solidified under Putin and Xi Jinping, because the two leaders have a very strong personal bond as well. They are authoritarian, they share the border, and there is economic compatibility between the two countries. Uh, that has been amplified by the recent crisis. I think that China is trying to not be visibly supporting Russia's annexation uh, and aggression in Ukraine, and at the same time maintaining pragmatic relationship uh, with Russia. It's a hard and tough balancing act,
but so far China is doing that quite okay. Alex, very, very quickly, you look at a country's trade policy, that should be informing their foreign policy. So in that way, it will be the line of least resistance for Beijing to actually accommodate and have open ties with the West rather than a similar relationship with Russia. Very quickly. The problem here is that China believes uh, more sanctions, more economic pressure are coming China's way from Europe and the U.S. because it's China. China will not stop its camps in Xinjiang or policies in Hong Kong. So why would you try to accommodate Western demands to stop your friendship with Russia, where anyway you are the major target?